Hi, I'm Matt Stoller, author of Monopoly-focused Substack newsletter, Big, and an antitrust policy analyst. I have a good segment for you today on this big breakdown. It's about AI and the policy choices we're making right now to structure how this remarkable technology is deployed. So let's dive in. Okay, so there's a ton of chatter these days about artificial intelligence. On Wall Street, within government, all over Silicon Valley, in the media, in Congress, constant hearings, constant chatter. Um, as just one example, let's, let's take a listen to 60 Minutes last month. We may look on our time as the moment civilization was transformed, as it was by fire, agriculture, and electricity. In 2023, we learned that a machine taught itself how to speak to humans like a peer, which is to say with creativity, truth, error, and lies. The technology, known as a chatbot, is only one of the recent breakthroughs in artificial intelligence, machines that can teach themselves superhuman skills. Ah! I, I mean, I'm rolling my eyes a little bit, but the, I mean, the technology is clearly important. Uh, it's not like fire or agriculture, but it's a big deal. Okay, so what, what is it? What is this machine learning stuff? Why is everyone so excited? All right, AI, it's a bad name, but what it means is it's a broad method of taking large data sources and running them through an algorithm to train a powerful pattern recognition software program. Unlike things like crypto or self-driving cars, artificial intelligence, this big machine learning stuff, it's real. It's a real technology. It actually does stuff. Um, AI algorithms underpin computer-assisted language production, image generation, engineering, and programming, a bunch of scientific endeavors. And some of the stuff that people have been able to do is pretty extraordinary. Take protein folding. Now, protein folding is one of those extremely difficult but critical problems in biology, it's useful for drug discovery, all sorts of scientific advances, and an AI program solved it. It's been like a 50-year problem that no one could solve, and they solved it in 2018 with one of these tools. Okay, so that's really good. But the thing about scientific advances is that how we deploy them, in fact, the very technology that we create is a function of law as much as engineering. So as an example, in the 1960s, IBM sold a certain kind of computer, uh, a mainframe, and it dominated the industry. These computers included all software that IBM told the customers they might need. It was all IBM software, and you got it for free when you bought the computer. Because of an antitrust suit, IBM unbundled its software to be sold separately, thus allowing rivals to actually make and sell software for IBM machines. The software industry was born. Okay, so we didn't have a software industry before that. That case created the software industry. And had that antitrust suit not happened, we may not actually have had one. We might have just thought of computers as this thing that you buy in a bundle. In other words, there's no one path for technology. Technology developed under different legal regimes, even if the know-how, the scientific knowledge is similar, actually is fundamentally different. And the thing is, is the monopolists know this. Okay, so now with all that in mind, with that context, let's talk about the politics of AI. Here's former Google CEO, Eric Schmidt, who is a monopolist par excellence, explaining that the industry should set its own rules. Let's take a listen. It shouldn't be a regulatory framework. It maybe shouldn't even be a sort of a democratic vote. It should be the expertise within the industry helping sort that out. The industry will first do that. Mm -hmm because there's no way a non-industry person can understand what is possible. It's mm. just too new, too hard, there's not the expertise. There's no one in the government who can get it right. But the industry can roughly get it right, and then the government can put a regulatory structure around it. Schmidt is one of the more important political figures in the last 25 years. He's highly influential under Obama, Trump, and Biden. Also the architect of Google's monopoly, one of these people that spans business and politics in a really savvy way. And Schmidt's commentary matters because it embeds two myths that characterize how we talk about power in America. The first is that markets exist as part of the state of nature until this external force called government comes in and regulates them. Now that's, that's not the way things happen. The truth is it's not whether to regulate markets, but how? Markets are not natural things. They are political institutions structured by human beings. There's all sorts of different types of markets. So for example, social media, it's a regulated industry. It's not 
unregulated. It's, it's just regulated to let Mark Zuckerberg decide what happens. And underpinning Zuckerberg's power is a whole host of public rules, from the corporate charter itself to property rights, which are mandated by government, to restrictions or abilities to use data in different ways. Now, Eric Schmidt's myth, and it's a broadly held myth, is, is done for a specific reason. They want to set up a question of whether we should regulate as opposed to discussing how to do so. And the reason to set the question up this way is to suggest that anybody that wants some sort of public input into how we innovate into the technologies that we develop will bear a heavy burden, because then you're asking for the government to come in and do something to this natural myth, this, the natural state of the market, the state of nature. Okay, so the sec that's the first big myth. The second myth is related, and it is that technology is merely a result of scientific or engineering prowess. It's just an external force that happens. And then again, government comes in to regulate technology. Again, this is to subtly set up tech barons as the legitimate arbiters of power. Now remember, they all operate through companies that are chartered by public um, by public mandates, they have ever, all their property is structured by public rules, but they wanna pretend otherwise. They develop technology, and then the idiot interlopers in the government try to make everybody wear a seatbelt, those nerds, right? But of course, this is all ridiculous. How we develop technology, as I showed with the IBM example, is a function of science and law, and you can see this all over the place from the breakup of Standard Oil to the breakup of AT&T in the 1980s, both of which unleashed in, in 19 teens and the 1980s, fantastic innovation in energy and telecommunications. You see this all over when, when uh, how we, we structure markets really has this kind of catalytic impact or it withholds innovation or it structures innovation down certain, certain paths. Okay, so why is Eric Schmidt putting forward these myths? Well, they came together in a very important deceptive question designed to structure the future of AI. And that is, will AI disrupt Google's search monopoly? This is an important question, right? And it's framed in a way that embeds these two myths into the question itself. So here's that same 60 Minutes program putting forward that sort of premise. Worldwide, Google runs 90% of internet searches and 70% of smartphones. We're really excited about But its dominance was attacked this past February when Microsoft linked its search engine to a chatbot. Okay, so Google's PR department presumably worked very hard to have 60 Minutes set up the question that way. Why? Well, because the government is threatening Google's monopoly. And I'm gonna get to this in a second. But in doing so, it's threatening the ability of any AI firm to monopolize the future. So in 2020, the Trump antitrust division accused Google of monopolization. And that antitrust case is being heard by a judge over the course of this year. Let's take a listen to a then Department of Justice official in 2020 explaining the case. This morning, the Department of Justice in 11 states filed an antitrust civil lawsuit against Google for unlawfully maintaining a monopoly in general search services and search advertising in violation of Section 2 of the Sherman Act. Okay, so specifically, the argument is that Google excluded competitors from the search market by making sure that Google is the default search engine anywhere you go. So, for example, the company pays 15 to $20 billion a year to Apple to force iPhones to automatically bring up Google search as the default instead of, say, something like Microsoft Bing. Um, Google bought Android, which is the operating system for the majority of mobile phones globally. It puts its search engine in front of users as the default, and then it collects search data from those users. It uses that data to tweak its own products, but also prevents its rivals from getting that data to improve theirs. In essence, one way to think of it is that Google bought up all the shelf space and says, you can't put rivals on the shelf space. It's just Google search. In all, Google pays $45 billion a year for contracts, just domestically, for contracts to block out rivals, signing deals with, and here I am quoting directly from the DOJ filing, Apple, LG, Motorola, Samsung, major US wireless carriers such as AT&T, T-Mobile, and Verizon, browser developers such as Mozilla, Opera, US, US, UC Web to secure default status for its general search engine, and in many cases to specifically prohibit Google's counterparties from dealing with Google's competitors. 
Okay, so you can see the resulting decade-long search monopoly in this timeline of the search market. Now, if you look at it, the most dangerous time for Google was between 2010 to 2012 for two reasons. First, the government came close to getting an antitrust suit. The government investigated, but it actually didn't bring a complaint, unfortunately. Second, at the time, in 2007 or so, Google had a desktop search monopoly. But the iPhone, the smartphone, starting in 2007, but really accelerating into 2009, 10, 11, 12, it opened up a new market and opportunities for new kinds of search engines that used location data and other, other things you can have on a phone. And these were potential rivals to Google. Consumer habits in desktop were had solidified, but they hadn't in mobile search. At the time though, and this is one of these inflection points, kind of like the inverse of what happened in the 60s with the IBM, uh, IBM uh, antitrust suit, policymakers decided to allow Google to leverage its power in desktop search to grab mobile search. So Google bought Android, and that didn't go challenged. There are laws you could challenge mergers, but the government didn't bring a challenge. And then it had all these contracts with distributors that were explicitly excluding rivals, and the government didn't challenge those either. So that technological inflection point is similar to where we are now with AI. As was the case then, there are lots of potential paths for what kind of technology we develop, what kind of AI-enabled web we have. And there's a, there's, a, there's a good analogy, like the Google story is sort of sad, but it was, um, there's, a, there's a better case where we can look at how stuff worked really well, not, and we don't have to go back to the 60s. The Google case that the government is arguing right now is built on a similar case brought when Microsoft was busted in the 1990s for doing something to a browser company called Netscape. Microsoft wanted to dominate this new thing called the internet. So it bundled its browser, its own browser, Internet Explorer, with its operating system and paid distributors, like internet service providers such as AOL, Yahoo at the time, to not carry its browser rival Netscape. In short, like Google is doing now, it bought up all the shelf space and tried to deny that shelf space to rivals. The goal for Microsoft was to make sure the entire web belonged to them. There's a lot more there, but I'm not gonna go into it. Uh, fortunately, though, the antitrust division brought an antitrust case, and so Microsoft didn't use its power over browsers to block the next generation of innovators. That Again, the Microsoft lost the case, but the remedy was overturned on appeal, very complicated. But the, but the basic point was brought forward in an article in 2020 by Charles Duhigg at the New York Times, who went back, talked to a bunch of Microsoft insiders about what happened in that period from the late 1990s to the mid-2000s when a whole bunch of new companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon were growing. So here's what they told him. He said, insiders were thinking of reprogramming Microsoft's web browser, the, the popular Internet Explorer, so that anytime people typed in Google, they would be redirected to MSN search. Or perhaps a warning message might pop up. Did you know Google uses your data in ways you can't control? Now, Microsoft was so powerful and Google so new that the young search engine could have been killed off. Um, but, quote, there was a new culture of compliance and we didn't want to get in trouble again. So nothing happened. The myth that Google humbled Microsoft on its own is wrong. The government's antitrust suit is a reason that Google was eventually able to break Microsoft's monopoly. If Microsoft, quote, if, quote, if Microsoft hadn't been sued, all of technology would be different today. That was a different lawyer involved in the case. Again, there's no such thing as an unregulated market. There's no such thing as deregulation. This is, this is bad language, bad concepts to stop us from thinking about power. We chose to regulate the uh, browser market, and, and operating softwares in the early 2000s to allow Google and a whole bunch of other companies to escape Microsoft's clutches, just as we chose to regulate the market in the 2000s and teens to allow Google to crush its rivals in search and throughout the web. And these choices led to different political and technological destinies. A lot of innovation, much more decentralized market in the 2000s, a lot of, uh, of authoritarianism, a much more monopolized market in the 2000s and teens. So let's get back to the current case against Google. The judge is a guy named Amit Mehta, and he is set to decide whether to toss the case, to narrow it, or to let it go to trial. In a recent hearing, the potential competitive threat of new technologies like AI chatbots came up. And the judge, Mehta, what, he was intrigued, and he sort of bought into the myths that Eric Schmidt was peddling, but he wasn't totally sold. So now it's worth asking the question, if AI is so great, why aren't AI-empowered search engines being offered to consumers right now where they actually engage in search? Now, Microsoft tried to do this, and a few months ago, Microsoft's Bing did actually get a slight bump in usage. But 
My, but Google was still at, at 90% of the search market, and now Microsoft's Bing is back to where it was. Google is still uh, a search monopoly. It's not what they say, but that is, in fact, the case. And Bing is not the only rival search engine to Google. There's, there's smaller ones, that, like Neva and DuckDuckGo, that have different approaches to incorporating AI. Neva is personalized and ad-free. DuckDuckGo doesn't track users. So these are differentiated products that you can use if, if you want. Um, but these search engines are not being presented to users because Google search is the default, so only really sophisticated users are actually getting to them. So unless Judge Meta rules against Google, then as Google rolls out its own AI programs, Google's AI programs will be the default as well. So here's a video on how Google is going to turn the whole web into its own walled garden by integrating everything that it has. That's remarkable. And they're going to keep doing things like that to, to make the web uh, its own walled garden. In fact, Google, using AI, will probably attempt to eat the whole web. Now, so that means that at worst, Google is going to control pretty much everything that we see. It, it, won't, it won't just control directing us to, to what we see. It will control what we see. Um, at best, if we don't, if, if Judge Meta rules badly, AI could be an oligopoly of the well-capitalized. So maybe you'll also have Microsoft or, um, or Facebook or Amazon, but that's kind of all you'll get. Well, we can already see firms preparing for different futures. One way to restructure search is to present what's called a choice screen to users instead of giving them a pay-to-play default search option. So that actually worked. Uh, in, in 2017, Russia did this, and it actually broke Google's monopoly. Uh, and if, if Judge Meta actually forced that as a remedy, the $45 billion of annual payments would just go away. DuckDuckGo and Neva could actually compete. And it's almost certain that companies like Apple would unveil search engines that they are developing. And yeah, Apple is actually developing one. They just, why would they deploy it if they're getting 15 to $20 billion from Google a year? If that money goes away, they will deploy their search engine. So you'll see a lot more competition in the search market if this, this um, monopolized structure gets taken away by a judge. So an antitrust de decision against Google would unleash an explosion of innovation around search, and that means AI-enabled search. More importantly, the deployment of AI would be less likely to be monopolized because this decision would create a presumption against monopolization in the new business environment. OpenAI, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, or anyone else who grabs a chokehold would have to worry about a judge ruling against business methods intended to restrain others in this vibrant space. That's how the law works. It works via precedent. The stakes here are high. In the last technological inflection point, the shift from desktop to, mobiles, to mobile, enforcers and regulators and Congress wrote rules to facilitate monopolization and allow Google, Facebook, and Apple to dominate our phones and the mobile web. That occurred by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, closing its investigation in 2012 against Google with a unanimous vote, allowing Facebook to buy Instagram and WhatsApp, doing nothing about Google suite of acquisitions, and Congress not actually coming in and making any laws around the use of data and various other things. Okay, but that was a different political moment. It, people were a lot more comfortable with monopoly at that time. They didn't think it was a big deal. But today, it's different. So this is an FT, a Financial Times op-ed by an, an activist named Sarah Myers West. And, and it shows that we haven't made policy choices, but there is actually a genuine dialogue about consolidation in big tech AI. See, move fast and, and break AI up. People know that there's a, a concentration problem. And it's not just that there's like a lot of chatter about it. I mean, I brought up, um, you know, West's op-ed, but there were like, there was hearing, there are hearings in Congress, people are talking about it all the time. Um, and it's not just that, there's actually an antitrust trial and that I talked about earlier, and it's the first of many. There's a bunch that have been brought to, against Google, but this is the first that's going to trial. And it's actually being brought by a reinvigorated antitrust division. And it may be the case that Judge Mehta rules badly. Maybe he'll rule that he wants artificial intelligence monopolized in the hands of a few. That would, I think, in my view, be a subversion of the Sherman Antitrust Act, but judges haven't done a particularly good job recently. It could also happen that he doesn't do that, that he met a surprises and acts like a judge called Harold Green, who was the courageous judge in the 19, early 1980s who broke up AT&T and did as much as, as uh, to bring forth an open future as any engineer in Silicon Valley. But regardless of how uh, Meta rules, the, the case is sure to be appealed 
and Congress is going to discuss it no matter what. So whatever happens, at least this debate is going to be done publicly with the government's antitrust enforcers on the right side, with the possibility of appeal and the possibility of congressional action, of state legislative action, of action all over the world. We have a long way to overcome the myths that I laid out in the beginning that Eric Schmidt put forward. These are very powerful myths. They are embedded in how we think. That is the false question of whether to regulate our markets versus the fact that they are just, there are rules and the debate is what kind of rules those are gonna be. Or pretending that technology is just this external force that kind of happens and that then government comes in to set some boundaries instead of seeing collective action as foundational to how technology is developed in one way or, or in another. It's always we the people that structure the path of technology. So it's on us as a democratic society to tell our lawmakers who represent us that we don't want our scientific knowledge, our engineering prowess, our innovation controlled by the few. We must be as jealous in defending our liberties as the monopolists are to take them away. But it starts with freeing our own minds from their bad ideas. So thanks for watching this big breakdown on the Breaking Points channel. If you'd like to know more about big business and how our economy really works, you can sign up in the, in the description below for my market power focused newsletter, Big. Thanks. And have a good one. Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now. And Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us. And if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.